Hello, my name is Derek Jorgensen, and the title of this presentation is Creating and Implementing Care Plans. Do you remember the last time a ball made you this happy? Now, I can't promise you that this lecture is going to make you as happy as these little kids look, but I can tell you that professionally, this is where the fun really starts being a pharmacist. And I'm not saying that sarcastically. Creating and implementing care plans as a pharmacist is where you literally will get the opportunity to change people's lives. I think that when you meet a pharmacist who truly loves his or her job, this is why, 100% of the time, when you get the chance to intervene and make a change for a patient that literally changes their life, it never gets old. I've been doing this for over 20 years now and it is still why I love coming to work every day. This is why I refused to give up my clinical practice when I came on faculty. This is why I created the Medication Assessment Center here on the U of S campus. Because now, not only do I get to be involved in changing people's lives at the Medication Assessment Center, but I get to teach students how to do the same thing. The funny thing is, sometimes it will feel like you don't actually do much for the patient. Maybe you have a care plan where you tell the patient to take all of their medications in the morning instead of three times a day. Big deal, right? But for some patients, this will literally change their life because now maybe they can rejoin their golf club and get out of the house more often. It's rarely going to be the kind of stuff where you're reaching into someone's chest and pulling them from the clutches of death, but it can come close. At the Medication Assessment Center, we've had patients with uh, terrible insomnia for decades who, after our intervention now, can get a good night's sleep again and they're functioning and all of the friends tell them they're a different person again. We've had per people with uh, uh, poor pain control who, after coming to us and uh, having their medications adjusted, come back and tell us that now they can hold their grandchild, whereas before they were too scared to drop them. Uh, we've had patients where we literally save them thousands of dollars uh, in prescription costs and now they tell us they can buy their groceries again and they're not. Uh, they're able to afford some of the basic things they couldn't afford before. So it's in the creation and implementation of a care plan where you will have the opportunity to use the information that you collected and used for your assessment to make interventions that will sometimes literally change people's lives. So the learning objectives of this presentation are that by the end of this session you should be able to describe the purpose and the components of a pharmacist care plan and you should also be able to complete a care plan for an uncomplicated patient with a rather simple problem. So just so you can keep track of where we are in the bigger picture, right now we're talking about the second step in the patient care process, the care plan. And after you've collected a detailed history about the patient, and assessed whether their drug therapy needs are being met and if there's any drug therapy problems, which is the first step in this process, you're ready to move on to creating a care plan, which we'll discuss in this presentation. So what is a care plan? So a care plan is essentially a plan for how you want to manage your patient's medications over time. It's really where you decide what you're going to do with the patient's medications to ensure their drug therapy needs are being met and to resolve any drug therapy problems that you may have found. Now this is typically an internal document that really contains your own thoughts uh, and the thoughts that uh, of your pharmacy team uh, regarding what to do that with the patient. It's not something that you'll usually send around to someone else, it's usually something that's only shared within your pharmacy team in the hospital or a community pharmacy or a clinic where you work. Sometimes care plans are written down formally on a document and sometimes it's a plan that you just make in your head for what you're going to do with the patient uh, with the patient's medications that you share with the patient and you never write it down. So pharmacists create care plans essentially whenever they are doing something clinical with the patient. It's just again it's not something that we always write down. So this includes uh, when we're dispensing prescriptions, when we have a self-care request from the patient and they're asking for some help to manage a minor ailment. Uh, this is something we will do when we're doing a comprehensive medication assessment like an SMAP in a community pharmacy. Uh, and really it's something that we would do with any clinical pharmacist service. So even when you're filling a prescription, 
you're following the, the patient care process because you're collecting a little bit of information from the patient when you talk to them and from their profile when you, when you look at the computer and you're trying to identify any drug therapy problems and make sure this prescription is going to be safe and effective for the patient. And once you've done that, you need to decide what you're going to do for the patient, which is when you will create a care plan. And in the case of filling a prescription, uh, you'll do it in your head, even if the care plan is as simple as um, the fact that you found no problems and you're going to have the patient uh, come back in a month for a refill of the prescription so you can assess how they're doing at that time. And you're going to have the patient monitor for any side effects and uh, contact you if anything uh, comes up. Now the nice thing is that all health professionals create care plans for patients. As pharmacists we create pharmacy care plans, but physicians will create a medical care plan, nurses will create a nursing care plan, and so on. And the overall goal in the health system is to use all of these individualized, individual specialized care plans to create one overall care plan for the patient that includes all of these professionals assessments and recommendations which is the importance of interprofessional collaboration. To find a way to somehow integrate all of our individual care plans for the same patient, which is certainly not easy and is a topic for another presentation. So let's start off with some important tips about creating care plans. Now we create a separate care plan for each of the patient's medical conditions, even if you found no drug therapy problems for all of the medical conditions. So for example, if the patient has diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and depression, you would create four separate care plans. Even if you only found a problem for the depression and you wanted to change their depression medications. Now this will make more sense once you see the main considerations in a care plan on the subsequent slides. But it's important because even if we don't find any problems, say with the patient's high blood pressure, we still need to think about what we need to do to make sure that they don't have problems in the future and we still need to think about when we'd like to follow up again with the patient regarding their blood pressure. Now the good thing is you will only create these care plans once, usually at the initial assessment with a patient and then you'll just update the care plans each time you follow up. So it's really not as overwhelming as a task as this may initially seem. And as I've already mentioned, uh, care plans are not always written documents in practice. Um, but as students, we're going to ask you to write down all of your care plans simply so we can see your thought process. And as you progress through the program, we'll stop asking you to write out care plans that you wouldn't typically write out in practice. So there are four main considerations in every care plan. The first consideration what goals of therapy are you trying to achieve with each medical condition is to ensure that you have decided with the patient on specific goals of therapy for each medical condition, which is something that should have already been completed in the assessment step of the patient care process when you were identifying drug therapy problems. And this is something that was already discussed in a previous presentation, so I won't go over this step again here. However, suffice to say, if you haven't already identified goals of therapy for each patient's medical condition, you need to do it now before you proceed with the care plan. But the point is that it's impossible to create a care plan for what you want to do with the patient's medications unless you know what the goals or targets that you and the patient are hoping to achieve for each medical condition. And so this is a key initial consideration in every care plan. The second consideration is to determine how you're going to resolve any drug therapy problems that you identified in the assessment. Thirdly, what interventions are necessary to prevent problems in the future. And finally, when and how frequently are you going to follow up and what are you going to monitor for the patient. And so we will um, discuss the details of each of these considerations in the remainder of this presentation. So now let's talk about the second uh, and third considerations in creating a care plan together, which is coming up with interventions or recommendations to resolve any of the drug therapy problems that you found during the assessment step of the patient care process, along with any recommendations that you might have to prevent any problems from coming up in the future. So this slide summarizes all of the options that you will have as a pharmacist 
to intervene to resolve any drug therapy problems that you might have found. So when you're trying to select the best option to resolve or prevent a problem, sometimes you're lucky and there really is only one reasonable option. For example, if the problem is that the dose of a certain drug was too high, then the only rational option is obviously to lower the dose. Or if you think the patient was on a drug that is not indicated or needed anymore, you should clearly be recommending to stop the drug. But things get much more complicated when there are many potentially reasonable alternatives to solve or prevent your problem, such as when you want to start an additional or a new drug to treat a problem like poorly controlled diabetes or chronic pain, and there might be as many as eight or even ten different reasonable options that you might need to choose from. So when you have one of these drug therapy problems that has multiple potential therapeutic interventions, you approach it just as you would if you were solving any problem in your life. First, you make a list of all the possible options that could reasonably solve your problem. And then you go on to make a list of the pros and the cons for each option to help you pick the best option in the specific circumstances. And this is exactly how we do this for drug therapy problems. So in the first step, you need to brainstorm a list of all the possible reasonable alternatives that might potentially resolve the drug therapy problem that you've identified and achieve the goals of therapy that you've created for this specific patient. It always tends to create confusion amongst learners regarding how many and which therapeutic alternatives you should be including in your list. This is a judgment call that you're going to have to make, and it will be different for each patient and each situation. It can be helpful to start by listing drug classes, such as ACE inhibitors, as opposed to specific drugs within a class, because this is usually where the most difficult decision point lies. For example, if a patient had poorly controlled blood pressure, who you think needs an additional drug, you might include in your list ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, calcium channel blockers, thiazide diuretics, and beta blockers. And if you're ever not sure whether to list a specific drug, I'd suggest erring on the side of caution and add it to your list. It's never a bad thing to list too many options on your list because you'll rule out the less desirable options in the next step anyways. There's certainly no magic number of therapeutic alternatives that must be listed, but usually there's two or three or four options. So if you have only one option in your list, you're probably missing something. And if you have five or more options, then you might think about trying to create a, uh, a smaller list to reduce your work. So the next step, once you've got your list, is to compare the pros and the cons for the specific patient that you're dealing with. So remember that we're always striving to provide patient-centered care. We want to develop care plans that are based on the desires, goals, preferences, and values of the specific individual patient that we're looking after. But unfortunately, sometimes the patient's preferences may be in contradiction with what best practices, clinical evidence, or guidelines suggest to be the best thing to do. For example, you may, ha you may be trying to select a diabetes drug for an obese patient whose primary goal is to lose weight but the drug that the guidelines might suggest is first line might actually cause weight gain. So ultimately a balance is going to need to be struck between the patient's goals and the best evidence when you are comparing the pros and the cons of the drugs in your alternative list. And this is the goal when you compare the pros and the cons, to consider the best evidence in the context of the history and the preferences of the specific patient who you, who you are dealing with. When you attempt to compare your alternative list, there are four sets of criteria that you should use to compare the pros and the cons of each option. You need to compare each option based on effectiveness, safety and tolerability, convenience, and cost. Now you're going to need to use the information that you learned in other courses, such as therapeutics, pharmacokinetics, pharmacology, and so on, to complete this step. Keeping in mind that you're always going to need to look something up. Nobody can memorize everything, and so when we're practicing these care plans in the lab or in class, you will be given time to look some things up. We don't expect you to memorize everything. 
The key factor that most students tend to struggle with most often in this, uh, in this step is to make the comparison relevant to the specific patient that they're dealing with. For example, you may have three different patients all with poorly controlled hypertension, but their individual goals of therapy might be slightly different based on the patient's goals and preferences. And as a result, the information you include in your comparison of options related to effectiveness might be slightly different for each patient. Now it can help to actually make a table to compare the options in writing. You don't have to do this, but as you're learning, it's usually much more effective. And we have provided you with a template and an example is on this slide that you can use to write out your comparison of the pros and the cons of each option. This template has been uploaded for you on Blackboard and it will also be provided to you in the lab. So here are some tips for how to approach comparing your therapeutic options when it comes to effectiveness. Remember the goal is to comment on aspects of effectiveness for each drug relevant to your patient's specific goals of therapy and your patient's preferences. So you need to think about uh, will each option in your list uh, likely achieve one or all of your patient's goals of therapy? And is there one option possibly more likely to achieve one or all of your patient's goals of therapy? And so you need to include comments in your chart that will answer those questions based on what you've learned about the drugs in therapeutics and things you might look up about the drugs. So it's really important that you just don't make vague statements such as uh, option one is first line and all the other options are second line. Try to be as specific as possible. If you know one drug is 50% more likely than the others to achieve a certain goal, then say so. And if all the drugs are approximately equally effective, also just say so. And here's some examples for effectiveness. Uh, the, the first one um, being too vague. So you might say, the guidelines recommend drug A to be used first line because it has been shown to be more effective than drug B, C, or D. So certainly this is suggesting that one drug is more effective than the others. But what we're looking for is something more along the lines of um, what is in the patient-specific box. So this would be to say something like, guidelines recommend drug A to be used first line because it has been shown to reduce the risk of stroke by 20% more than drug B, C, or D, and our patient is at high risk for a stroke due to his family history, and he told us that his biggest concern was to try to avoid having a stroke. So drug A is most likely to achieve this patient's goal of therapy. So hopefully you can see in this example, we've taken the evidence that drug A is more effective than the others, but made it specific to this patient's goals of therapy and this patient's preferences, and we've been as specific as possible regarding how much more effective it is than the other drugs. Another option that I would suggest being too vague, all options are equally effective for treating diabetes. And if you wanted to be more specific, you could say all options lower blood glucose equally and therefore all will be equally likely to achieve this patient's goals of therapy. So just taking the, the fact that they're all the same essentially and linking it with uh, this specific patient's goals of therapy. So here are some tips for how to approach comparing your therapeutic options when it comes to safety. And when I talk about safety, I mean things, that, things about each drug that might potentially harm the patient. Things like contraindications, drug interactions, allergies, or really any other safety issue that's relevant to this patient. So it's important not just to list contraindications or drug interactions from the product monograph if they aren't relevant to your patient. So if the drug is contraindicated in pregnancy, don't put that in a list for a woman who's not of childbearing age or for a man. And if there are no relevant safety issues, you can just say so. And this is actually often the case. Often there are no contraindications, interactions, or allergies for your patient for any of the options, which makes it simple to answer this question. But if there is one safety issue relevant to one of the drugs but not the others, it's a pretty important thing to recognize. And here's some tips for how to approach comparing your options when it comes to tolerability. And when I talk about tolerability, usually I mean annoying kind of side effects. So here it's really important to not just list all of the common side effects for each drug. This is not going to be helpful to you in picking the best drug for your individual patient if you just have 
four options that have random side effects that are all different listed in the box. What you really want to do is list the side effects for each drug that might be relevant or particularly bothersome to your patient. So you want to list side effects for each drug that might be relevant or bothersome to your patient or side effects for each drug that might lead one drug to be less well tolerated than the others in your patient. So here's an example where you might uh, have three different drugs and for drug A you might say that it has no common side effects that are relevant to this patient and it's likely to be equally well tolerated in this patient compared with drug B. And essentially you say the same thing for drug A. So essentially drug A and drug B have no side effects that we're worried about for this patient and they seem to be about equally well tolerated. Whereas drug C has been known to cause weight gain and shortness of breath about 5 and 2 percent of the time um, and this might make this option less well tolerated than the other two drugs because this patient is obese and has asthma. So hopefully this illustrates how we've picked out specific side effects that are relevant or bothersome to this patient and used those to compare which drug will be likely better tolerated in this patient. And finally here's some tips for comparing convenience and this is something that students generally have much less trouble with and do a really good job on. And here you want to comment or focus on things that um, obviously might make one drug more convenient than the others. This is usually related to frequency of dosing. It could also have to do with complicated dosing instructions uh, like the oral bisphosphonates which need to be taken first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up half an hour before you eat or drink anything else or take any other medications. Uh, you might think about uh, uh, less palatable dosage forms. Some patients don't like rectally administered drugs and would prefer an orally administered drug. And accessibility is something else you might consider if some options are available without a prescription. And finally some tips for comparing cost. Um, now it's not necessary to list exact prices for each option. Listing ranges or estimates are okay because the main goal here is really to compare relative costs. Is one option significantly more expensive than the others or are they all about the same? That's really what we're going for here. Um, it's also important to include a comment about the patient's uh, insurance. So if the patient has insurance, um, is, are all the options covered? Because even if they're all about the same price, if one of them is not covered by their insurance, that's going to be a significant factor for the patient. Now this is something that we often won't require for junior students who don't know much about drug insurance yet. Never ever state something like all the options are covered 100% by this patient's drug insurance so cost is not an issue. Cost is certainly always an issue even if the patient has insurance because remember who pays for the drug insurance? Most patients are covered by a public drug plan so taxpayers are paying for their medications and even if they have a private drug plan a private insurance company is charging the employer for the insurance plan so um, never say that uh, you know, cost is not an issue if the patient has insurance. It certainly may make it less of an issue for the patient but it's still important for you to uh, consider the drug cost. So once you've considered all the pros and the cons within these categories now you've got to pick an option. And sometimes or more commonly nowadays usually after completing this process there's no clear best option. Often there's one or two options that seem about the same. And this is where you really need to use your professional judgment and to really consider the patient's preferences in picking one of the options. So one thing that can be really helpful in making this decision is to try and discuss your proposed recommendations with the patient before suggesting them to the physician or making a final decision yourself if it's something you don't need to discuss with the physician. Um, this, is, this is something or a step that will be key in uh, and being patient-centered with your care and certainly the patient may have an opinion about one option over the other and so if you were on the fence about two options and the patient has an opinion then that's going to really help you. Uh, certainly if the patient disagrees or refuses with uh, refuses the thing you're going to suggest then why would you bother moving forward with it and suggesting it to the physician if the patient's never going to do it. And the other thing that happens more often than you'd think is that once you suggest a specific option to the patient they suddenly remember that they tried this option in the past even though they didn't mention it to you when you collected the information in the patient history. Sometimes you need to discuss your recommendation with a physician and sometimes you don't. 
When you do need to discuss your recommendation with a physician, it usually occurs in two typical scenarios. First, in cases where your recommended change is a drug that is not a prescription or that you can't prescribe. And second, in cases when you'd like the physician's opinion even if you could prescribe a recommended independently. For example, maybe you're not 100% sure what to do or maybe you don't have quite enough information about the patient's history to be really confident about uh, how to move forward. So when you do recommend something to another health professional, like a physician, it's vital that your recommendations are what I call solution focused. And this means that your recommendation is specific about what exactly you are suggesting. So you need to suggest a specific drug name, not a drug class. You need to suggest a specific dose and a route of administration. You also need to state when you think the change should be, should be implemented unless that's obvious or implied. Uh, you need to make it clear who is responsible for implementing the change and it's usually good to include a brief rationale for why you've selected that specific option. Obviously it's useful to use diplomatic and non-confrontational language keeping in mind that the, the problem that you may have found uh, very likely was suggested initially by the person you're talking to. Uh, if you're changing a drug, it was probably this physician who recommended that drug in the first place, so you need to be careful not to insult anyone. Um, it's important to use no abbreviations, even if you think it's a common abbreviation. Uh, write everything out. Uh, you just don't know uh, who understands the abbreviations that you might be using. Avoid any jargon, and certainly items on the ISMP, or Institute for Safe Medic Medication Practices Do Not Use list, should not be used. And that's a list that you can uh, you can look up and that we'll provide for you in the lab uh, so that you don't use any unsafe um, uh, terms or abbreviations. Here's some poor examples or non-solution focused recommendations. Recommending to start an ACE inhibitor is not specific enough. An ACE inhibitor is a drug class. Recommending to stop a tenolol is not specific enough. You want to know um, when do you want to stop it? How quickly do you want to stop it? Do you want to taper it or stop it immediately? Uh, number three, educate the patient about adherence is not specific enough because it's not clear who should provide this education and when are they going to do it. And so here's some better examples. Number one, you might suggest that the patient starts Ramipril 2.5 milligrams once daily today. Number two, you might suggest that the patient lowers their atenolol dose to 50 milligrams orally once a day today, then 25 milligrams once daily on October 5th, and then stop it completely on October 15th. And number three, you might suggest that the pharmacist is going to meet with the patient next week to discuss the benefits and risks of his medications to encourage long-term adherence. So let's finish this presentation up and talk about the final consideration in a care plan, and this is to decide when and how frequently you're going to follow up, and what exactly are you going to monitor. Now this, this is the step where I think that we as pharmacists uh, drop the ball most often. Uh, in my experience, I think that we can often be really good at making suggestions, but sometimes not so good at following up on what happened when the patient made the change. And this is perhaps the most important step in the process because if we don't do this, we'll never know if we made the patient better or worse with our recommendations. I got this quote from a past preceptor of mine who said, if you don't follow up, you probably don't really care. And I think this says a lot about the importance of following up and monitoring as a pharmacist. So every intervention that you might have can have positive and negative impacts on the patient that you can't always predict. There are going to be times when you're going to make a mistake because you're human and you need to make a plan to catch these bad outcomes before the patient is harmed and so you can change the plan to something that hopefully will work. And so the purpose of following up is to monitor three things effectiveness, safety and tolerability and adherence. You want to decide how you're going to, det going to determine if the goals of therapy have been met for the patient and has the drug therapy problem that you uh, identified been resolved. Uh, you need to determine if the patient tolerated the intervention and if they've been able to make the recommended change and be adherent to it. 
So what makes a good monitoring parameter? Now it's important when you have monitoring parameters to be clear and specific regarding what specific parameters do you think need to be monitored, who's going to monitor them, and how often should the parameters be monitored. Keeping in mind that the who doesn't always need to be the pharmacist, you can certainly suggest monitoring parameters that another health professional or even the patient monitors as long as you're clear about communicating to those individuals that you, um, you have assigned the responsibility to them for the monitoring. So here's an example of a good monitoring parameter. The pharmacist will ask the patient about how many times his asthma has made him miss school every time he comes to the pharmacy to refill his asthma inhalers. And so this is an example of an effectiveness monitoring parameter because we're monitoring how effective the patient's asthma medications are. Uh, the who is the pharmacist, the what, the what is of the parameter is, um, the frequency of uh, missed school due to asthma symptoms, and the how often is uh, whenever the patient comes in for a refill of his inhalers. Some tips for filling out the monitoring parameter section of your care plan and creating monitoring parameters. Uh, so first of all, you should have one effectiveness parameter for each of the patient's goals of therapy. And hopefully this makes sense because if you remember the purpose of each goal of therapy was to define what targets that we would use to determine when the medical condition was successfully and effectively managed, it should only make sense that we should monitor whether or not we have achieved each of these targets. So it can be a good self-check when you're making a monitoring plan uh, to look at how many goals of therapy you had for their asthma and see if you have the same number of monitoring parameters for the asthma. Secondly, most side effects and safety parameters can be monitored clinically, which is uh, usually by asking the patient, but you may need to check certain lab values to also uh, monitor tolerability and safety. For example, you might check the potassium and the serum creatinine when starting the patient on certain cardiovascular medications. As I alluded to already, you can also make the patient responsible for monitoring certain parameters. Just make it clear how they're going to follow up with the health professional uh, when and if something goes wrong with that monitoring. So for example, you might have the patient monitor for side effects such as cough and a rash and have them contact the pharmacist if anything arises. And so this is a good example of a tolerability monitoring parameter. Or secondly, you might have the patient monitor their blood pressure at home with their home blood pressure machine uh, on a daily basis and have the pharmacist ask about the results when the patient comes in for a prescription refill in a month. And so this is a good example of an effectiveness monitoring parameter for hypertension so here's an example of what a monitoring plan might look like for a patient with high cholesterol who just started on a cholesterol medication today. So you can see here we have monitoring parameters for effectiveness, safety and tolerability and adherence. In this case the patient only had one goal of therapy for their uh, cholesterol and that was to uh, say lower the cholesterol to and the LDL cholesterol to less than 2.0 uh, within uh, three months. And so here we have the effectiveness monitoring parameter that the physician will be uh, responsible for checking the patient's cholesterol level lab test in three months. So we have specific about who, uh, what is the cholesterol level, and specific about when in three months. Uh, secondly, we have the pharmacist asking the patient about side effects such as muscle soreness, uh, weakness, and discolored urine, which are some common side effects of a uh, statin cholesterol lowering medication that the patient was started on and the pharmacist will ask the patient about this when she comes in for a refill of her cholesterol medication in one month and finally the pharmacist will ask the patient about adherence in a month when she comes for a refill of her cholesterol medication so again all of these are specific regarding who is responsible specifically what they're going to monitor and when they're going to do it so most pharmacists use a form or a template when they create a written care plan. And there's many different versions of these forms and templates out there. And it doesn't really matter which one you use uh, because they all should include the same information and they all should prompt you to follow all of the rules that I just mentioned. We do have two options available uh, for use in the lab and copies of each have been posted to Blackboard and will be provided for you in the lab.
And there's one uh, example uh, on this slide here you can see just as an illustration. And you see this specific one even has some prompts for you to remind you about some of the key uh, rules to follow that I've mentioned in this presentation. So this concludes this presentation on creating care plans for pharmacists. Today we talked about the fact that there are four key considerations that should be included in every care plan, which are summarized on this slide and which I've gone through in detail in this presentation. And you'll have lots of opportunity to practice making care plans in the class and the lab.